Hi, today we're going to uh, take a little tour of the world of criminal sentencing. So the way in which we choose to sentence uh, criminal defendants, people who have been convicted of crimes, is incredibly important. There are just remarkable political consequences to our sentencing structure. Um, for example, uh, there is sort of naturally a disproportionate effect on women who are sentenced to prison as opposed to men. Not that men have it easy if they go to prison, but when it comes to federal prison sentences, most, uh, there are very few federal women's facilities. So uh, what ends up happening is that the federal government either contracts for some beds with the state facility or more likely ends up sending um, the female prisoners, female uh, criminal defendants to another state to serve their time. So for example, uh, when I lived in Minnesota, <clears throat> there was no women's facility, federal women's facility in Minnesota. If a woman was sentenced to prison in Minneapolis, St. Paul from anywhere in the state of Minnesota, she was if she was lucky, going to go to Southern Illinois to serve her sentence. And in fact, many of our female offenders ended up serving their sentences in West Virginia. Um, so you can imagine when <clears throat> you are serving a sentence that far away from home, your ability to maintain social ties to your family, to your community members, it's really basically nil. So the consequences of serving that time in prison and your ability to reintegrate into society afterwards is severely compromised. Uh, another reason that we need to be very concerned about sentencing and sentencing equity is that um, while someone is in prison, they typically are unable to support their family. So imagine you know, a family of four um, a mother, a father, and two children, sort of the, the classic leave it to beaver type family structure. If uh, mom, for example, ends up going to prison, that means that dad is now responsible for those children by himself. Um, so not only are they potentially losing mom's income, but they're also losing uh, her ability to care for the children, to transport the children, to school, um, and of course their love and support as well. So when a person ends up going to, to prison for any, any period of time, really, it's not just the person who's imprisoned who ends up suffering, but also members of their family. Another reason that we have to be very cautious about uh, sentencing and thinking about the ways in which sentencing affects different groups of people differently is because many states have what we call pay-to-stay laws. Um, a lot of people, you see these memes, right, on social media where people talk about you know, the fact that you go to prison and you get free health care and you get free meals and you've got, you know, a roof over your head where you didn't have one before. Uh, you don't have to pay rent. That, that's actually not the case. In many states, uh, people who are incarcerated are expected to pay their way. They're expected to pay for their housing. They're expected to pay for their food. They're expected to pay co-pays for their medical visits. Um, what's more, they're, may, they're sort of given food. Again, some places they're paying for it. They're given food, but there are other things that they need to purchase through a commissary system, sort of like having a little in-prison shop. Um, and that includes snack foods like ramen and Coca-Cola and candy bars. But it also includes hygiene products like deodorant and toothpaste and shampoo. And if you can't, if you don't have any commissary money, you can't purchase these things. Um, a lot of the phone calls that prisoners make from, from prison are also, uh, uh, charged. Uh, that's not the right word. Um, they are also, you have to pay for them. And those phone calls can in fact be very, very expensive. So keeping up with your family, trying to stay in touch with them is difficult. Um, 
And the end result is that sometimes people will go into prison, they're already poor, they come out owing thousands and thousands of dollars. So let's take just a moment to talk about some sentencing vocab, some sentencing lingo. Um, one thing that I want you to be thinking about as we sort of move forward in this module is the difference between determinate and indeterminate sentencing. Determinate sentencing involves giving someone a specific amount of time. For example, sentencing them to 37 months in prison. That is their sentence. No more, no less. Well, maybe a little less, but definitely no more. Indeterminate sentencing provides a minimum and sometimes a maximum, so 20 to 25 years or 20 years to life. And the idea is that after you have served that minimum, then you become eligible for parole and you start to go in for parole hearings. Uh, the parole board is in states that have a parole system. The parole board is part of the executive branch and it's a group of people who meet and they listen to the facts of a criminal case, again, sort of a summary of them, and they talk to the inmate to figure out whether this person has been rehabilitated and whether they should be released uh, back into the general population, back into the community. Um, and parole boards end up having a tremendous amount of authority. So for example, um, uh, Charles Manson, who a lot of people are familiar with, who sort of masterminded uh, a number of murders in California in the 1970s, he's been up for parole many, many times. He's never going to receive parole. He will, in fact, probably die in prison. Um, so uh, whether or not you receive parole is entirely up to the parole board. When you are paroled, you typically have some responsibility to uh, maintain contact with, for example, a probation officer. Um, there may be uh, sort of conditions of your parole that you have to abide by to avoid going back to prison. Um, things like you know, not doing drugs or not hanging around with, uh, with known criminals or um, you know, a variety of, of different conditions that may be imposed on you as part of your parole. Probation is just a little bit different. Uh, probation is itself a form of sentence. And when you are on probation, you again have a, a, a number of conditions you have to meet, such as uh, maintaining a job, um, not drinking, not doing drugs, not spending time with known felons, uh, attending counseling sessions, you know, whatever conditions the, the court wants to impose upon you, they, they basically can. And while you're on probation, you typically are paying uh, some money to sort of support your probation officer. This is the person who's making sure you're following all the rules. And if you violate your probation, again, you can go end up going to prison. Um, probably one of the things that people are least familiar with when it comes to criminal sentencing is the idea of either intermittent sentences or work release programs. These are pretty common in other countries, particularly in Northern Europe, but a little less so here in the United States. An intermittent sentence is one where, let's say you're sentenced to 30 days in jail. You can serve that 30 days over 15 consecutive weekends and then during the week you're actually not in jail. So you serve the, your, your time but you don't serve it all in one chunk. It's spread out. Um, this is usually in order to allow you to uh, watch your children um, or to maintain a job or to go to school. Work release is very similar, although typically with a work release program, you're spending every night in jail, uh, but during the day you can leave so that you can go to a job. Um, again, not all states have these programs, but some states do. The last thing I want to talk about in terms of kind of the, the vocabulary of sentencing is a, a concept called good time. Um, a lot of times you'll hear this as time off for good behavior. Um, good time is a sort of mechanical 
reduction in sentence. So for example, let's say you are in a state that has a good time program that gives you one day for every two you serve. So, and you are sentenced to three years in jail or in prison. If you do not have any infractions, if you do not lose any good time, every two days you spend in jail, you earn a day off. So in theory, after two years, you would be released. You would have done two of the three years. If, however, you do something wrong, right, you talk back to a guard, or you don't make your bed properly, or whatever, whatever the rules are, if you violate the rules, you get into a fight, whatever, um, the penalty, part of the penalty can be loss of good time days. So you're effectively lengthening your sentence. Um, you can't lose so much good time that you end up spending longer in jail than you would have for your original sentence, uh, but you can certainly end up having to do uh, what we call straight time, which is the full term of your sentence. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about theory. Uh, there is a jurisprudential theorist named A.L.A. Hart, and um, Hart's theory of justice dictates that in order to be just, the law has to provide both uniformity and variance. Specifically, a just system will treat like cases alike, but it will also treat different or unlike cases differently according to that difference. All right, let's unpack this a little by looking at an example. So imagine we have two criminal defendants, Joe and Mary, and they rob a bank. They rob the bank together. So they have effectively committed the exact same crime. In order to treat like people alike, we should see pretty comparable sentences for Joe and Mary. Mary shouldn't receive a lower sentence because of her gender or because of her race. Um, Joe should not receive a more stringent sentence because he's tall. Um, we sort of irrelevant factors should not play into this process. And instead, if Joe and Mary really did the same thing, they should get the same sentence. To the extent that they are similar people, they should be treated the same. But that doesn't mean that every single person who robs a bank should get exactly the same sentence because there may be differences in their behavior or differences in their circumstances that in a just system would be included in the sentencing decision. For example, if Mary is the one who planned the bank robbery, perhaps she should receive more time. Um, if she's a lot older than Joe, Joe is maybe 18 and Mary's in her 30s, potentially Mary should receive a longer sentence because Joe is younger and more impressionable. Um, if Mary is in fact Joe's mother, she might uh, deserve a longer sentence because she is taking advantage of her child in order to uh, perpetrate a crime. Um, if Joe has average or above average intelligence, but Mary is actually mentally impaired, Mary probably shouldn't serve as much time. She's not as guilty. There is a difference between Joe and Mary that actually matters, that should matter. And if instead Joe and Mary get the exact same sentence under these circumstances, that is unjust. But if they're the same, right, they're both 22 years old, they're both white, they both have average intelligence, they planned the, the crime in the same way, neither one of them was on drugs, neither one of them was drunk, um, you know, they're basically identical people, then we do want to see them get the same sentence. If they don't, then that makes us feel like the sentencing structure is arbitrary, and that's, a, that's bad. Okay, so again, what ideally we want 
is a system of sentencing that limits discretion, right? That doesn't allow a judge or a jury to just randomly pick a sentence for somebody. Instead, we want a lot of direction to ensure that like cases are treated alike and receive the same sentence. But we also want a sentencing structure that is flexible enough that we can actually account for those differences in culpability. We could, in sort of the level of guilt that a person should experience. So to the extent that um, there's a factor like age where we feel that younger people are less guilty than older people, we want a system that's going to represent that. The trick is, how do we thread that needle? How do we come up with a system of sentencing that is fair, that is equitable, but that also takes into consideration the actual variation in the human experience. So we see a pretty stark split in addressing this issue uh, between state governments and, federal, and the federal government. Most states use some form of indeterminate sentencing and the ranges are very, very broad. So for example, the sentence for uh, armed robbery might be 10 years to life, right? So you might, you might be sentenced to 10 years, you might be sentenced to 15 years, you might be sentenced to 15 years to life, but sort of the possibilities are, are vast. So going into the trial, you as a criminal defendant don't necessarily know what you're up against. You don't necessarily know what kind of sentence you're going to face on the other side if you're convicted. Um, states that have this sort of broad range and indeterminate sentencing rely very heavily on something called a pre-sentence investigation. So let's go back to Joe, our robber. Um, let's imagine that Joe has been convicted. The jury says Joe is guilty. And the judge says, okay, great, we're going to meet back here in three weeks or a month for sentencing. During that interval, during that time between the conviction and the sentencing, a probation officer is going to conduct a pre-sentence investigation. And this involves looking at Joe's life, his history, both his criminal history but also his history in terms of his education, his family background, whether or not he's maintained a job over the course of his lifetime, um, you know, sort of everything that you might want to know about him, a, a kind of psychosocial history of Joe. Um, and they're going to talk to other members of the community, Joe's spouse, Joe's children, Joe's parents, to find out what role Joe plays in their lives whether he is an important contributor, for example, to the family finances, or maybe he's taking care of his elderly mother. We want to know all of that. That pre-sentence investigation goes into a report, and that report is then turned over to the judge, who can use that information in order to make a more uh, sort of nuanced decision about what kind of sentence is appropriate for Joe. The federal system has taken a, a very different approach to sentencing. The federal system has decided, <laughs> effectively, thanks to Congress, has decided that discretion is the enemy. Um, discretion leaves room for bias. It leads, leaves room for judges to sort of run amok and um, either be very soft on crime or be overly punitive. And so the federal system aims to take as much discretion and guesswork out of the process as possible. So the federal sentencing structure is guided by something called the Federal Sentencing Guidelines, which are themselves crafted by the Federal Sentencing Commission. The Federal Sentencing Commission is created by Congress. It's a bipartisan independent agency. And most of the members of the Federal Sentencing Commission are themselves federal judges. 
their lawyers, their law professors, they're people who have a pretty strong understanding of the criminal justice system. There is always an ex officio representative from the U.S. Attorney General's office and an ex officio representative of the U.S. Parole Commission. Uh, there are people who are still sort of grandfathered in for uh, parole eligibility in the federal system. So the way the federal sentencing guidelines works, they're really, really interesting. You're going to have an opportunity this week to actually apply the federal sentencing guidelines, and you'll kind of be able to get in there and, and muck around a little bit and, and sort of explore them. But basically, in every case, the court calculates an offense level and an offender score. So the offense level starts with a base based on um, whatever the crime happens to be. So the crime of kidnapping, for example, has a particular base offense level. Um, the crime of possession with intent to distribute narcotics has a different base offense level. And then that offense level goes up or down depending on a variety of factors in uh Drug cases, one of those factors is how much drugs is involved, are involved, not sure how that works. Uh, so whether you have a pound of marijuana or five pounds of marijuana, that is going to make an, a big difference in your offense level. Um, if you use a gun in the commission of a crime, that increases the offense level. Uh, if you actually harm somebody in the commission of a crime, that increases the offense level. So there are a number of factors that can either increase or decrease the offense level. In addition, the court is going to calculate an offender score. Here, we start with the person's criminal history. So the number of, of uh, sentences they have served of a year or less and the number of sentences they've served of a year or more, those are going to be sort of calculated to come up with a, a starting point for an offender score, then that offender score is going to go up or down based on a number of factors. Um, your offender score may go up if you played a central role in planning uh, the crime. Your offender score may actually go down if you cooperate with the authorities and agree to testify against um, your co-conspirators, if you accept responsibility, if you admit that you did it, right, that will actually lower your offender score. So again, there are a whole host of factors that will either raise or lower this score. Then there is a matrix, right, a, a table, and it is one page, one page of a book <laughs> that is a table where you, um, basically find the spot where the offense level row and the offender level or offender score column meet. And where the offender score and the offense level meet, you'll see a range of about 18 months. And at that point, the judge is, for the most part, required to sentence you to something within that 18-month window. So it's a very narrow window. There's not a lot of flexibility for the judge. The guidelines do leave open the possibility for something called an upward departure and something called a downward departure that kind of move somebody out of the traditional guidelines range. So for example, um, there may be an upward departure if um, the crime is sort of worse than the worse than the typical crime of this category. For example, if, if there's sort of extreme psychological torture of the victim, that might justify moving the, the sentence uh, up a bit. Um, someday, when we're just hanging out, I will tell you the story of the very first prosecution under the federal cyber stalking statute. Um, I assisted my judge with that particular case. And the guidelines range was uh, put the defendant's sentence squarely at five years in jail. 
Um, but he absolutely tortured his victims. His fa- the family that he was stalking experienced unbelievable hardship because of this event. And so the judge uh, departed upwards and actually ended up giving him 10 years in prison. Um, downward departures are usually um, because the defendant has some sort of diminished capacity. You can also depart downward if the victim participates in the crime in some way um, or if um, the victim is hurt less than you would typically see for a particular type of crime. So a downward departure allows the judge to move down from the sentencing guidelines. Okay, uh, that's all. Um, Please read the article by Justice Breyer and then uh, complete the worksheet with your colleagues.